Lots of things to catch up with Keith about. Um, some of the, well, maybe the viral moment from the booth uh, in Cincinnati when he was at home that I want to get his take on. Also, obviously, DeGrom, uh, what's going on with the Mets bats? Is this really who they are? Lots to discuss on this episode of the Shane Anything Podcast. It starts right now. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. It's Doug Williams and Keith Hernandez with you today. A reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And once again, Shane, anything is brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. So, um, Keith, I'm not sure if you were alerted to, uh, you know, Gary's thoughts on Skyline Chili, and we'll get huh. your thoughts on Skyline Chili in just a second. Let's let's play this. Uh, I want to get your take, and uh, we'll talk about it on the other side. This is the local delicacy known as Skyline Chili, the five way with the spaghetti five and way. the beans <laughs> and the cheese. Five way. First, the uh, the disgusting chili gravy. And what do you now put on the that? onions? Do you put some mustard or something on that? Wait a second. When the, after the onions comes the cheese, and that's what makes it the five way. Here we go. There's the cheese. They put like 10 tons of shredded cheese on there. And this is supposed to be food that you actually eat. Now, does the cheese melt or is that a... a Ronnie, Ronnie, have you ever had Skyline Chili? I have not. I have not. I would recommend... Not that, having it? Or? Well, no. You, you need to try everything once. Okay. Right? All right. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Try it once and then you'll never eat it again. Strong remarks. Um, some folks in Cincinnati were... We're not offended. too pleased. Today we're offended. Yeah, I think that's the right word. Keith, have you ever tried it? I have not, and I won't. <laughs> and I think everybody understands why I won't. You had a good look at it. All those, all those viewers had a great look at it. And um, I was watching when that was uh, that game when it when they went through their little routine there. And uh, I will not be a team player with Ronnie. I am normally a team player, but I draw the line on Skyline Chili. I'm going to be selfish. I am not going to ever try it. So you don't agree with Gary's philosophy that you should try everything once, try it before you knock it? Well, Doug, if I was as young as you and not packing the extra, a little bit of extra weight, I would try it. But how many calories are in a plate full of that, do you think? What th- uh, I think more than a more than a day's full for me. Yeah. Well, what threw me off was Gary said five way, which I guess includes the spaghetti. Ugh, the last thing I need is chili on top of spaghetti. Now uh, I've fair- never heard of that one. In fairness to Skyline Chili, I know that's only a way that you can get it. It's not the only way to have it, but right. Oof, watching that video. And Ronnie asked an important question. Does the cheese melt? I know it's a mound of cheese, but you don't want to be eating dry, kind of like cold cheese off the top of chili. Yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> neither of us is going to be eating it anytime soon. What um, what was it like working with Gary Thorne? Because I, I couldn't believe when I turned on the TV and I heard that voice, it was like, is that Ed Coleman? Who could that possibly be? <laughs> And then very quickly, I recognized the the unique voice. Yes. And um, what was that like? Well, I'd worked with Gary before when Gary was still here uh, doing te- television, uh, did doing the games for the Mets. That's when I was first starting. And I've known Gary. I mean, he came to the Mets in, I think he said, 84, 85. So I've known Gary in my playing days. So we are friends. And um, it was interesting because the games – were so bizarre mm-hmm. and he hadn't broadcast in a while he's never broadcasted without the game in front of him off the video and relying on the uh, camera work in uh, pittsburgh on the world feed um it was wonderful working with him i thought that he it, it took him a game the first game that well, was so friggin wild uh uh but uh I thought the second game he got back into the frizz rhythm and um, well, that was the game they lost. Incredibly lost. Right. The second game. Yep. And he the, uh, had the walk off grand slam. Yeah, he had one of the most understated uh, outs 
as we moved off and he said, yikes, I do. <laughs> I would hope. We were talking about my Spanish, my, my days in two years in high school, Spanish, and Gary took French. So he, uh, and it was a yikes, that loss. And uh, uh, I, I just thought that was a great out, uh, but it was great working with him and catching up. And we're going to work again together I gather on that Philly series when the Mets go to Philadelphia. Um, it was so cool to hear his voice again. And um, it is, it cracks me up that very infrequently do you ever work with a play by play guy where you don't, you can't say Gare. Cause when Gary Cohen's in there, obviously you call him Gare. Gary Apples filled in for him and you call, you can call him Gare. And now um, Gary Thorne, it's very, it makes it, it makes your job a little bit easier. You, you don't have to, you know, learn some stranger's name and, and uh, toss back to somebody named, I don't know, Felix or something. Well, um, I, made, I made a point pretty much the majority of the broadcasts to call him Gary. I Gary. Made a point. Yeah. So Gare is reserved for Gary Cohen. Yeah, Gary and I, are, Gary and I, are, we've been working together for 16 years and that's what I, my brother's Gary, my older brother, my only brother only sibling and uh i always called him gare that's why i call gary cohen gare because it's like talking to my brother right i i cannot still can't get over the series that, that you worked in pittsburgh though i mean i know you weren't there you were in at city field doing the games but um the roller coaster ride <clears throat> that was those games i mean like was your takeaway from that um that was a bad dream and the Mets can kind of just push that aside. Did you bring anything out of that series that was concerning about this team moving forward? I had a feeling they were going to win when they were down. And I said it on the air when they yeah. went down five, nothing, or was it six, nothing? I forget. And I think it was uh, six, I just, nothing. Yeah. I just had a hunch. They were going to come back that this was going to be a reversal of fortunes. And the Mets were going to come back and get them. Uh, and you know, the pirates don't have good pitching. And that was why if it had been a team like the Giants, you know, or someone with Braves, uh, you know, Dodgers, that's, that's a tough comeback. But I just felt that uh, the, with that pitching staff, they would get them. And, you know, Rodriguez, their closer, doesn't throw that hard. And he gave up the home run uh, to Conforto. And he had only, that's only the second home run he'd given up all year or third. And I think a pitcher sometimes can get a little cocky and I'm not saying cocky is not the right word, but maybe he hasn't given up home runs and he's getting away with this high fastball and Conforto uh, got it and kind of rocked his world. And it was just a huge, uh, it was a big, big, big win for the Mets. So, um, but you know, the, the play with the Walker and all the three runs scoring and oh my God, it was just, and you know, the, well, I had to see it over again because I mean, the camera work I thought yeah. was okay, but who can anticipate that? And uh, I had to see it again because I'm watching the monitor on that's the feed to the fans and really probably you can't anticipate that happening. And, you know, give hand, hats off to Joey Cora, the third base coach. He kept on waving those guys around. Yeah. He was on it. So it was a re remarkable play, um, uh, incredible play. And uh, it was a bit embarrassing, but, you know, they bounced back. I'm, I'm curious because I agree with you. I was watching so closely at the camera work because I was waiting for like a really slow from home plate, you know, view of the baseball and we got one that showed that clearly some of the baseball was on the line so it was fair but when you see the angle from walker's vantage point i can totally understand why he thought the ball was foul right well i didn't under what i didn't know and gary uh came back the next day when he came back he didn't come back the next day because he wasn't working when he the first game in cincinnati that the, i did not know that the ball doesn't have to be touching the line because it's round it's spherical and uh just as long as the body of it on the arc, if it's on the line, hmm. it's fair. I did not know that. So you learn something new every day. But most importantly, the big mistake was Walker didn't have to shoo it off into the dugout. Right. Just grab it. Ball's dead. 
or if it's fair, it's still alive. But if it's a still alive and he calls it fair, only one run scores. Right. Not three. People uh, brought back memories of David Cohn. And yeah. uh, it was I, it was funny because Coney was tweeting about that and saying, you know, once it happens, people never forget. You just have right. to kind of joke about it years and years later. Um, oh. And at least Cohn had the ball. <laughs> Cohn was fired up, but at least he had the ball on his person. Um you know, it was interesting. I, you, you, you used the word embarrassing. And I know that that's a word that you use a lot because as a former player, there were moments that you felt like that. And you always wanted to see somebody bounce back. Um, after Walker made that play, Rojas obviously gets tossed, ended up getting suspended. He was really fired up. Mm -hmm. um, don't you think if you're Walker, it feels good that even if deep down, you know, okay, I screwed up that your manager's behind you and is willing to die on that hill with you? Uh, I just think Louis, Luis was warranted to go out there and, uh, you know, he didn't have a great angle and trying to the Mets are on the first base dugout, but the dugouts today are so far away from home plate or up the line more. Uh, I'm sure he didn't have the best of, of angle, but um, that's certainly the most uh, angry I've seen him. And I really think the uh, suspension was unwarranted because of, I mean, if they had said he suspended two days because he bumped the umpire, fine. But he didn't say that. They said Aggressive arguing? arguing. Ag yeah, give excessive a, arguing. Give me a break. You know, let, let, let's go have tea and crumpets out there and everybody play patty cake. I mean, give me a break. Uh, so he should not have been suspended. He should have been fined and he should have been allowed to manage. So that was the, the first of our um, three battle rule. I kind of skipped over the label of the segment. But the second one, Keith, is Edwin Diaz. Um, mm -hmm. First time in his career, he's blown three straight saves, as I'm sure you know. Um, last year, 60-game season, um, but in the middle of it, Rojas, you know, as you remember, brought him back to the like fifth and sixth inning and kind of he earned his way back to the high leverage spots. Would you do that here with him uh, because it's worked in the past or would you just wait for him to try and work his way back to being himself? No, oh, it's too soon uh, to uh, push him back. He's That would be, I think, emotionally devastating for him. And I think you got to go with him. He gets in trouble when he goes three quarters and he gets out, out of, off from coming over the top. That's what happened the first year. His ball runs away and he can throw it to the backstop sometimes. And uh, he... Uh, He's kind of hard to figure out. Uh, you know, he, he's been great all year, and now he's kind of hit a speed bump since the All-Star break. Uh, but he needs – he can't throw three quarters out here. He's got to throw up here, and that's what gets him in trouble. When he's out here, his ball sails, and he can't command the fastball, and then his slider flattens out or he hangs it, and that's the problem. And – um it's an easy fix. I'm sure they're on it on the sides, but they need to certainly need him to get it back together. Jeremy Hefner, that's like the first thing he always says when he's asked about Diaz getting on top. Um, so to your point, I I'm sure they're working on it. And I think Keith, honestly, that the Diaz conversation is bigger than just like, what do you do with him right now? I think Mets fans are looking ahead to a team. That's probably going to be a playoff team. They'd hope being like, are we really going to be in a 3-2 game against the Padres in October and, and Diaz is going to come in in the ninth inning? And, like, how is that going to feel? So, like, do, do you think that Edwin Diaz is capable in a Met uniform of, you know, changing the way Mets fans feel and making it feel like the game's over when he comes in? So Met fans are unsure of him. Yeah, I think to say the least. Um. Well, we'll find out, won't we? I don't have that answer. Uh, when the, when it comes crunch time with the postseason, I do think the Mets will get there. I think our division is weak and well, not weak, but mediocre. And I think we're the best team. And uh, I think we'll get there. I think we're going to win our division. I'll, I'll go out on a limb. I think we'll win it, win it handily. But we still got games to play, and we still got the Giants and the Dodgers to play home and away. Uh, important part of the schedule right now, and I know I'm getting off track and I'll get back, is that we're going to start playing in division after we get through with Toronto. 
And uh, we got five game series with Atlanta. And then the Nationals and the Phillies, it's a big opportunity for them to really, if they can dominate and they got big homestand right now, they can get some distance, open up some, some distance and get them further in the rear view mirror. Uh, as far as Diaz, uh, like I said, uh, he's still going to go out there and close games for me. He benefited more last year from any player on that team from the pandemic uh, with no fans. Because he had a he had a bumpy April last year, he came into the he had to come. I mean, we're human beings. April he slash had, June, so it was last year's April was right, really right, July. Right. It was July, right, yeah. Right. He had uh, that year, uh, the year before, uh, one of the it was a nightmare year. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a closer have a worse year giving up long ball. It. it he's a human being. It had to go over, and he had to have some trepidation uncertainty going into the uh the pandemic season last year and he got off to a shaky july and uh i think if there had been fans in new york and it had been uh, booing him with blown saves i think that it would have been much more difficult for him but i think he really benefited from not having the fans and the pressure of that uh last season and it's carried over this year. I mean, really, he's been solid the whole first half. He hasn't since the second half. He's had three in a row. Okay, fine. Uh, but no need to quit on him right now. Uh, and you know what? For Mehmet fans that are uncertain whether he goes in there and saves it or not, um, well, that makes it more exciting. I know you'd rather have it. Uh, and I played with Bruce Suter, so it was an automatic. And Bruce Suter used to come in not to start an inning in the ninth. Bruce Suter would come in in the eighth or the ninth with runners in scoring position, the go-ahead run, the tying run, and come in cold out of the bullpen and have to get big outs, not start an inning, not have three-run lead. with uh, You just get three outs and get a save. Okay? And the other side of that it would be when we had Doug Sisk in 84. And with Doug Sisk would walk the bases loaded and they had to throw up a double play. So uh, we'll see what happens. It's going to be interesting. The Mets certainly – need him to perform like he did in the first half yeah i mean it's funny because we've been covering chapman with the yankees and diaz with the mets and both guys at the same exact time are going through these terrible periods and it, it really does make you realize even if you look around the league right now i mean i mean obviously everyone brings up mariana rivera but you look around the league right now with very few teams have locked down no stress closers and even the best blow some um so you just have to hope that the diaz uh issues are behind him i just think to your point keith about 2019 it was so bad that the skepticism of that hasn't worn off and i don't blame i don't blame mets fans for still being skeptical i mean andy made this point on the podcast earlier this week that season of his was so bad in 2019 it's probably the reason that team didn't make the playoffs um so if if you've done that to a fan base, you can't expect one good 60 game season to okay. change the way you feel. So then um, it's, I agree. It's going to take it's, uh, it's this, this year. Yep. It's going to take look October. At Armando, look at Armando Benitez. I mean, he was a terrific closer for the Mets and he coughed it up in the postseason all the time, drove Mets fans crazy. Right. You so know? that that's kind of the opposite though, because Diaz has shown you in regular seasons that he can be decent, but it is going to take him not pulling a Benitez. It's going to take him in October bases loaded bottom of the ninth, getting the big out um, for Mets fans to be like, okay, you're our guy. Like, well, I just, if it's bases loaded, bottom that's of the ninth, true. If it's bases loaded, <laughs> if it's one, bases two, loaded, three, he, one, two, three in the ninth. <laughs> yeah. Three, two game. If one, two, three one, two, inning. Three. Go um, down. Bases yeah. loaded means he probably walked the bases loaded and Mets fans' blood pressure is rising in, in, the, right. in the stands. Um, that's a good point. So third of the three batter rule. Um, so DeGrom is on the injured list. He now says that his latest injury was from throwing. He felt it throwing. All the ones before that, he credits swing in the bat. Robert Stock, who's one of the many Mets pitchers that they've had to go to and rely on in their current situation, 
uh, his body breaks down as he's basically trying to go to a gear on his way to first base that he hasn't been to probably since he was in high school. Do these pitchers injuries, Keith, convince you at all that it's time for the universal DH? No, I, it, it's going to happen, but it's part of the game. It's strategy. Um, we're going to lose next year. It's going to happen. It's a bye-bye to the pitchers hitting, but the managers managing the flip-flops of the lineup, uh, more importance for have a bullpen. Um, it's, I'm, uh, I'm not going to like it, but it's, it's coming. So, but it's not, it's nothing to do with uh, pitchers getting hurt, uh, swinging the bat or running the first base. You know, it's, I, they didn't happen that it doesn't happen that often. I mean, you know, there are some, some examples to point to. I, it's almost as if they pitchers weren't ready for the, the universal DH to, to go away this year. And there's been some injuries, but like DeGrom is a very good hitter. So you can understand why he swings the bat. But I think generally, I, I, I think your point is well taken that it's about the strategy late game mid to late game. I think a lot of people, when they talk about pitchers hitting, it's like, why do I need to watch the starting pitcher take three at bats? Do you see what I'm saying? That's a, that's the boring part. You're talking about the exciting part of pitchers hitting, but there's also a very boring three at bats that you have to endure. Well, unfortunately there's a lot of boring at bats in the course of a game with everyday regular players, but then striking out so much and swinging and missing some, a lot of them. So, uh, but Pitcher comes up four times a game if he goes nine. Not even four times anymore because pitchers don't go nine. He's going to get up a max of three times, most times two. So suck it up and watch the pitcher hit. And may, watch him try to get a bunt down. And maybe he gets a base hit and wins a ball game or is in a part of a big inning. That's the joker. That's the wild card in the deck is the pitcher hitting. I, I thought it was funny. Did you do you remember – I don't know if you were watching um, – Diaz, a save he eventually blew, but he walks the the leadoff batter in Cincinnati and Tucker Barnhart, their catcher, comes up. And again, he walked the leadoff batter on four pitches and Barnhart swings at a first pitch slider in the dirt. He ended up uh, striking out on three pitches. And, you know, Gary was gone. I know. I heard it. And Ronnie said, hitters have never been smarter and more stupid i'm quoting him but i'm pretty sure that's what he said okay so yeah so they they know more than ever but they also know less than ever if i have have, they have more information but they use it wrong i have if i've got a pitcher that's in trouble and has, has walked people and it's having trouble finding the plate i am first ball fastball hitting if i see a spin on it I'm not swinging unless he throws me a hanger. I'm on a fastball. Tucker Barnhart's a 220 hitter. Come on. You know, the 220 hitters, they, they swing at bat. That's why they're 220 hitters. I mean, obviously, he did not recognize a slider. And when he's looking for a fastball, if you're looking for a fastball first pitch, because you've got a pitcher that can't find the plate, then you swing at a fastball. If you see any spin, you take it if you're a 220 hitter. So obviously he didn't see spin, and that's probably why he's a 220 hitter. I know I'm beating up on him, but you know, it is what it is. All right, you're listening to the Shay Anything podcast. It's brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets from the network. More people rely on only on Verizon. Uh, Keith, the team has been different since returning from the All Star break. A lot of runs. I think um, we were all expecting their position players to hit at some point. This has been maybe a, in a correction that we didn't realize was going to come uh, as significantly as it has. Do you, what do you think that if let's say everyone on the Mets is playing well, what is their identity? What should they be the team that outscores you? Or do you think they're going to win on their pitching? I think they need pitching now with everybody banged up. I don't think they need to add to the offense. So I'll just make that statement. Um, they're not barn burners. Uh, offensively they haven't been yet i mean uh pete's getting a hit every you know getting a hit hitting a home run but he hasn't gotten into a hot streak he's 
Uh, I think Don is swinging the bat so much better now. Uh, McNeil is, uh, even though he's in this hot streak, um, he's had his difficulties. And this, I don't want to throw water on it, but you faced a poor pitching staff in Pittsburgh and another poor pitching staff in Cincinnati. So uh, you get, and as a team, you got to take advantage of that. You got to beat up on those teams that that have, uh, I mean, the good hitting teams wallop the bad pitching staffs. That's what you're supposed to do if you're going to win. To take advantage of that, so uh, you got Toronto coming in, and then you got the Braves coming in for five. Uh, I think that the Nationals are looming. I don't know the schedule in front of me. The Nationals and Philly—they're all. Uh, coming back you know, coming back through and the competition is going to pick up and I just think this uh, homestand is a huge opportunity for this team especially the five games with the Braves and they're wounded what they beat up on the Braves at home they can phew, see you later bye you know and um, on to the next so we'll see did you were you in- interested at all in those two, you know, really tough Luis Guillorme errors in Cincinnati and then mm-hmm. kind of n- not just how he responded because he he hit, you know, everything for the rest of that series, made some good defensive plays as well, but also how, you know, Dom brought him to the post-game podium yesterday and like um, it, when you had a teammate who worked as hard as Guillorme clearly does, who has the talent that Guillorme clearly does, do you rally around a guy who ha- goes through an issue like that and you know that that's not the player he really is, that he just had a bad night? Yeah. I mean, he was probably a little unsettled. I mean, Lindor's down, and I really don't know if Louis felt he was going to be the main guy to play shortstop. You know, I, I think that he was, might have been caught by surprise. I was. You know, now Peraza's got the broken, with the fractured finger, so he's out of the equation. Peraza played a lot of shortstop um so you know he probably was a little unsettled he compounded his his errors with the glove swiping with i mean which was he did it twice he'll never (laughs) do that i guarantee you he'll never do that again okay you make an error you make an error you eat you eat the ball and uh, louis is a smart player he's a good player and um it's just taking a while to settle in he's got good hands he's a good fielder uh, there's no reason why he can't play shortstop. And uh, he's getting more, again, he's going to get an opportunity to play more because they're probably going to platoon it short. So he's going to get a lot of opportunity to play and get a rhythm. It's too bad Peraza went down. That's a that's a that's kind of a subtle blow right there, particularly only because of Lindor being out for such a long time. Uh, so Louis will be fine. I didn't know that Don brought him to the, podium so uh i know it's a t- it's like it's you know it takes a village kind of mentality down there i guess um it's a little different when i played you know but it is what it is and uh, these guys pull together uh this team likes each other and uh i think that's how it shows and, and uh, they really care about each other and they pull together and they make a point to be that way and that's fine I have no problem with that. It's, it's all good. It's all good. They've got enough veterans on this team to keep this this team going on an even keel. I worry about the younger players going up and down the emotional ladder, and I just love the fact that you've got the Perazas, uh, you've got the VRs, you've got the Pillars uh, that have been around. They're veterans. They know how to play. They know this game, and, they, and if you notice them, they don't get up and down. They don't jump up and down. They're, they're, they're fiery, but they kind of are, I feel, a calming influence with the young players on this team. I think that's invaluable. I just I bring the Guillaume thing up because it, it goes to show you that professional athletes aren't wired like, like I am. Because when I watched him make those two errors, and I know exactly what you're talking about, it, it was like he tried to swat the ball midair on its way down. Like the error is already happening, and he's trying to get the ball over the bag. And I was watching, I was like, wow, this is, you know, a really good defensive player kind of melting down. Like, I wonder what happens here. Do you take him out? Do you get, and, you know, not only did you not do that, keep him in the game. 
he has a really good rest of his defensive series. And then he hits his first home run of the season. And I think that the Dom decision to bring him up there, I don't know this. I saw them together on the podium. So I'm assuming a lot, like I'm just assuming that Dom was the guy the Mets made available. And Dom was thinking, you know, Guillaume should be up there. He's got the most interesting story to tell from his series. He just hit his first home run of the season. He's only hit, I think, like two in his career or whatever it is. Well, they both could have been up there. Yeah, they maybe they both were sent up there. I don't know. You got a grand right. slam. That's, that's true. Dom that's, did have a grand slam. They both deserve to be there. So I think it was a good thing that Dom did. I I, I didn't realize that happened. I don't watch the post game interviews. They're on Sorry. Zoom still. They're they're it's. We got to get rid of Zoom. I'm sorry to be so hard on Zoom. I, I love your technology and I love what you've done to give us all the ability to talk to each other like we are right now. But I'm ready for you know press conferences to happen in person, meetings yeah, to agree. happen in person. I agree. I agree. Um, I think you last thing, Keith. I think you you mentioned this earlier. You wanted pitching depth all along, but now that Degrom's out. Now that Carrasco struggled a little bit in his rehab, do you think it's a an urgent need? Yes, I think starting pitching absolutely. I like our bullpen. Um, I think it would be nice to be able to have a second left hander out there. You know, just a journeyman left hander. I've always believed that instead of the managers just having Loop, who Loop has just been fantastic. Uh, what a year he's having, how solid has he been? But it, there's times in the middle of a game, particularly in the National League, for at least one more year this year, without until the DH comes, that you might need an out in the fifth inning. You know, you, you, or you need two outs in the fifth inning in a, with the starter struggling, have that second left-hander. Otherwise, the bullpen's fine. Uh, the starting pitching because of the injuries. So... It's McGill tomorrow and Walker Saturday. Right. Uh, TBD, TBD Sunday. And then a doubleheader on Monday. So we're there, you're going to find arms, you know? So they, I think that the immediate, that tells you right there what the immediate need is. They need, they need starters because of the injuries. Yep. And uh, DeGrom threw yesterday, um, but very lightly. Well, they're going to be um, careful with him. They're going to be careful, yeah. and also too, I thought I just kind of, I my take on uh, Carrasco's outing is he had a torn uh, hamstring, not a pull. He's thirty four years old. That's serious. He probably went out there and was a little tentative. It's got to be in the back of his head. So I think as long as he stays healthy, and they've nursed him as they should, because that's a tear is terrible, and. Um, I think he'll get better, and uh, as he rehabs, it may take a little bit longer. So I, I don't take anything. Go, oh my God, Carrasco got got his, got lit up in Triple A. He'll get better. He'll be fine. He's a pro. Just keep him healthy. Yeah, we'll see where his uh, his next outing comes from. Um, a reminder to subscribe to the Shane Anything podcast. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen, we appreciate it. And also a reminder that Shane Anything is brought to you by Verizon. It's 5G built right for the Mets. From the network, more people rely on only on Verizon. All right, Keith, enjoy uh, the rest of your off day that we've hijacked. And good luck yes. with the, uh, the weekend. And we'll talk to you soon. I'm looking forward to this uh, whole next week, a whole homestand coming up. I'm really yeah. looking forward to it. We'll find out a lot by the end of it. All right, man. Be well. And uh, thanks for listening, everybody.